The human hand is an interesting appendage. It's often used as an extension of our will, whether we wish to extend goodwill or invoke bad will. I'm your host, Leah. I'm Phil. And I'm Steve. From decoding hand gestures to delving into legends and lore, join us as we examine the human hand. I'm waving at you. If you have an appetite for the strange and bizarre, then pull up a chair and grab a spoon for another intriguing serving of Remnant Stew. Remnant Stew is gluten-free, organic, made from all natural, free-range ingredients and guaranteed to provide the recommended daily serving of curiosity. One of the most common ways we communicate with our hands is through a handshake, the traditional and somewhat formal way of greeting someone that you've just met. But have you ever wondered how this became a standard greeting? Yeah. Well, tell us about it. The handshake <laughs> has existed in some form or another for thousands of years, but no one is really certain of its origin. One popular theory, and, and I tend to believe in, in this one, is that it became a way to greet someone while at the same time to show that you have no weapons in your hand. Uh, yeah, open hand. Yeah, open hand. Right. A closed hand would indicate that perhaps... Uh, Something's in there, yeah. A, yeah. That, that or you're going to punch him. That's in your hand. Yeah, <laughs> true. And then the shaky motion was maybe to dislodge a weapon that's hidden up in the uh, sleeve. Nothing up yeah. my sleeve. Yeah. See? So a closed hand would indicate the possibility of a concealed threat. So an open hand by, you know, opposition and an empty hand became a sign of peace. Oh, good. The handshake then became a way of concluding an agreement. While everything would be written in detail in a document, the deal would not be sealed until an earnest handshake was performed to make it official. <laughs> And we've talked before about gravestone symbols of um, like the two hands gla- clasped in greeting, depicting right. maybe like the welcoming of a deceased, of the deceased to heaven okay. by a loved one that had gone on That's before. Yeah. Right. Which I really like that idea. Yeah, give me a hand up. Um, so today we're looking at hands. We're looking at our hands, exploring the incredible complexity of them and the different ways we use them to influence our communications and our cultural lore. Well, this should be fun. Um, consider the hand. It's really quite remarkable when you examine it. According to a website called the Hand Institute of Charleston.com, there are 29 bones in the hand and wrist, as well as a whole slew, that's my wording, not theirs, <laughs> a whole slew of blood vessels, nerves, tendons, ligaments, and joints, as well as skin and nails. The dexterity of our hands uniquely separates us from other mammals. The presence of our wonderful opposable thumbs separates us even from many monkey species, some of whom have no thumbs at all and others have less developed thumbs. Remember uh, that uh, episode we had, uh, I think it was last year, the International Weird Monuments? Yes, I, I remember that. that. Yeah, oh, yeah, the, uh, that was one where we had the um, one of the monuments was to a... Uh, <laughs> he can't even say it, was, it. <laughs> are you talking about the enema the enema yeah the enema, the enema monument. Monument. That was good. well this one the one i was referring to though here in paris somebody was so proud of their thumb that they actually built a 40-foot statue of it and you can still go visit it in paris today that's, that's a, a big thumb that's yeah, the hitchhiker's guide thumb. right there <laughs> well as wonderful and remarkable as our hands are there are times when they can get us in trouble no. Yeah. I recently ran across a terrific article on HowStuffWorks.com called 10 Obscene Hand Gestures from Around the World, <laughs> written by a talented young journalist named Melanie McManus. And we are grateful here at Remnant Stew that Ms. McManus and HowStuffWorks.com have given us permission to quote directly from this terrific art article. Thank you. So thank you so very much. So should I mention if they need a sponsor? <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> uh, keep it to yourself. Now, we pride ourselves here for running a clean podcast Mm -hmm. that even children and great aunts can listen to, and we're going to keep our discussion clean today, even though we're going to be covering some obscene gestures. So how are we going to manage this? Uh, Well, we're not sure yet. We're going to draw them out for them? (laughs) Hang with us and we'll see how it goes. Using your imagination, folks. (laughs) According to Ms. McManus, many hand gestures that are innocuous or positive in one country can be incredibly insulting or obscene in another. To make things more difficult, a gesture's meaning can also differ within a country, depending on locality. It may also have a particular meaning only to one subset of people, no matter where it is in the country you are. 
You could think uh, keeping your hands in your pockets uh, would solve all the problems, but even that's, that's considered offensive in places such as France, <laughs> Japan, and Sweden. So yeah, even just even oh, I'm not going to hurt anybody's feelings by just putting my hands in my pocket. Oh yeah, uh, you they will. have pockets. <laughs> Maybe you can just keep your arms crossed across your chest. Nope. nope. In uh, Finland, that's a sign of arrogance. So, <laughs> what to do? Well, before you finish packing your bags for your upcoming trip, familiarize yourself with the following hand gestures. Some are considered very positive in the United States, but all are deemed insulting in at least one spot around the globe. And so, let's go ahead and start off with the most obvious one, that middle finger. <laughs> yeah, you know, as a teacher, I just retired after 42 years, and I had to break up my fair share of fights and arguments. One frequent source of the disputes was, quote, he shot me the bird. <laughs> Well, I can't tell you how many times I've told the students, you know, that finger has no power over me unless I allow it. But unfortunately, that lecture usually fell on deaf ears. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't quite get over it. On the other hand, see what I did there. Uh -huh. uh. Uh, I used to work with a group of teachers in Puyallup, Washington. Uh, okay, let me explain this school. It was a school for kids with really severe behavior problems. And we had some really intense uh, situations that we dealt with. So at the end of the day, there was, uh, you know, staff meetings, and we often uh, blew off steam, and shooting the bird at one another was kind of a regular part of the jocularity. So <laughs> what is it about that middle finger anyway? Well, this is actually the most offensive gesture in America, but it's been around a long time. According to McManus, quote, this is a very old insult, even used by the 4th century philosopher Diogenes, and always known as a phallic gesture. The finger is largely understood and used throughout the Western world, even though other countries might have their own preferred gesture to impart the same meaning. So, okay, i got to tell you a personal story here. Story time. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> when I was in about the sixth grade, I didn't know what this gesture meant. So I asked a more mature and worldly eighth grader, <laughs> and uh, he calmly explained to me that it was a special police officer wave. <laughs> <laughs> And when I saw that's a policeman, great. that I should give that uh, give him that special wave. Oh, that's a great eighth grader right there. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been looking for that guy ever since. <laughs> a few weeks later, I'm riding down Interstate 10 with my mom. Uh, when I see up ahead a highway patrolman on the side of the road, and I'm thinking, this is my chance. I'm going to give him the special police officer oh. wave. So I casually did. Within a minute, my mom noticed some red lights flashing in the rearview mirror. The officer informed her that she was going 83 in a 70 and wrote her a ticket. Mom said she didn't realize she was going that fast. Must have been her new car, she said. <laughs> but I knew better. <laughs> I knew that I, she got the ticket because of what I'd done. I said on that secret for the next 30 years or so. <laughs> Finally confessed it to her at her 80th birthday party. Oh, my goodness. How'd that go over? I was hoping that the uh, statute of limitations had run out by that time, and it had just barely. Moms <laughs> don't have statutes of limitations. So she, She's like, she, that's cute. So you know, She did see the humor in it So by the time the, that she was 80, and I was uh, in my 40s. So, She's still you know. doing the dishes. <laughs> So take it from me, kids. Don't shoot the bird at a police officer or anyone else for that matter. That's right. Now let's go. Well, this one's a little bit nicer sign, or at least uh, in our culture it is. The OK sign, or sometimes called the AOK. -okay. Is everything all right? In America, you might respond to such a question by flashing the AOK -okay sign, created by touching your forefinger to your thumb and pointing the remaining three fingers straight up. While the origins of this action are unclear, it appears the symbol is an attempt to create a crude O and a K. The O is certainly clear, although not quite as much the K. This gesture is also widely used in the diving world to both ask if a diver is fine and for the diver to respond back that he, she, or, he or she is okay. And honestly, this is probably my most used emoji. I like the okay emoji. All right. Uh, now, well, don't make this gesture in Brazil, however where it's akin to giving someone the finger. <laughs> According to McManus, perhaps the worst misuse of this sign in recent history was committed by then-Vice President Richard M. Nixon in the 1950s. The VP emerged from his plane in Brazil, making an A-OK -okay sign with each hand and enthusiastically wagging them uh, to, assume, uh, to the assembled crowd. <laughs> Not surprisingly, the people were astounded and infuriated at this double insult. <laughs> 
That's nope. funny because when I when I think of Nixon, Nixon. I think I yeah, think the, of the, the, double, the double V, the double V sign of victory. Crook. So somebody oh, probably oh. informed him, no, don't no, do the OK do. sign, at least not in Brazil. <laughs> in Greece and Turkey, the OK sign is also seen as quite vulgar, and it insinuates that the person to whom is given is gay. In some Middle Eastern countries, the sign is a symbol for the evil eye. I can oh, wow. see that evil eye kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Now, you don't see this one as much in the United States, but I, I observed it in uh, in Italy. Uh, among all of the possible hand gestures that can be misinterpreted around the world, the chin flick may be the least confusing. Oh, okay. uh, Though not as common in America, you might have the habit of flicking your chin while you talk. In much of Italy, people will make the gesture, which involves placing the fingertips of one hand under your chin and then quickly... Uh, uh, quickly flicking it out towards the person to whom you were speaking. This indicates that you couldn't care less about that person, what they were saying, their dog, the scrape on their fender, or anything else, really. Frankly, my dear, they just don't give a care. See what it did there? <laughs> yep, uh, we got it. <laughs> it can also mean that they're positively not willing to do something. Um, there's a stereotype about Italian folks that they talk with their hands a lot. And, you know, sometimes there's reason for stereotypes because they do tend to <laughs> talk with their hands scary. quite a bit. In northern Italy, France, Belgium, and Tunisia, the chin flick can be used to tell someone to get lost. Maybe even a little bit more aggressive language than that. And speaking of aggressive, if someone wants to be quite emphatic about their intended message, they will make the gesture quite forcefully rather than just a casual flick. Right. Like, boom, yeah. you know. It's funny because as, <laughs> as, as he's done. <laughs> He's yeah, you talking. can't see this, but imagine me doing yeah, well, it forcefully rather than casually. And as you're going through these, like me and Phil are like doing all of this. <laughs> We're doing all the sounds, like check it out. Yeah, we can check it out. But okay, so I grew up with um, a girl that that had Italian heritage, right. you know, and she taught us this. We, now, the way right. you're describing it is not the way she described it. Like she <laughs> described it as it was really bad. Yeah. And so we started doing it towards each other, like <laughs> right. you know, and the teachers didn't know, but. I, you know, I say the teachers didn't know. I'm sure they yeah. they might not have been aware of the exact gesture, but they were aware of the intent because kids are not that. You yeah, know, they're, they're they're not. Yeah, pretty yeah. transparent. So, well, I've heard of it in uh, in Hispanic cultures somewhat too. Uh, you would do it, and you would say "tucada," which means your face, which is supposed to be an insult. Ooh. Oh, you know? <laughs> well, now I've never heard of this one though. Okay, we probably play this game with little kids. Um, uh, kind of a fun game to play with babies and toys. You'd uh, reach your finger, o your hand over, and you say, "I've got your nose." After you uh, make a uh, playful, uh, gentle swipe, I've now done that a few hundred times. Yeah, now to prove that you've really snatched their nose, you hold up your your hand, curled in with fist, with your thumb sticking out between your pointer and middle fingers. Your thumb, of course, is supposed to be the baby's nose. Alas, while this is a game is common in the United States, Australia, and Canada, it's never played in Turkey. In that country, the hand gesture, commonly known as the fig, is like calling someone an unprintable name. <laughs> We're not going to say it either. So it's don't also quite grab insulting a to people. Nose. Got it. It's insulting to people in Indonesia, India, and in some other Asian countries. The gesture hails back to ancient times when the Romans used it to indicate a sexual union, but in a positive way. That is, to wish someone good luck and fertility. It also was seen as a protective uh, me measure against the evil eye. The Romans called the gesture monofico, or fig hand. And that's what we're talking about now, the fig hand. Uh, and they, they felt that the thumb and the fist, well, they kind of look like a woman's uh, private parts. Fica is Italian for fig, and it's slang, slang in Italian for female private parts. So ancient Romans equated figs with female fertility. Uh, and so that's where we get the fig hand. Okay. Uh, kind of unfortunately, the very same uh, gesture is the letter T in American Sign Language. Yeah. So, whoops, you know, <laughs> you accidentally <laughs> insult somebody like that with the sign language. Now, this one we see a lot here in the greater cut-and-shoot area uh, where our palatial studios are located. The hook'em horns and gig'em aggie. Oh, yeah, yep. yeah. Those are insulting. <laughs> they could be to each other, yeah. <laughs> um, because uh, the, these these two symbols represent the largest universities in the state of Texas. So let's talk about hook'em horns first. This is created by extending the index finger and the pinky finger outward, 
while tucking the rest of the fingers into the hand. This gesture attempts to symbolize the Texas Longhorn mascot, Bevo, uh, who is a Longhorn steer. The signal was developed in 1955 when Harley Clark, the UT head cheerleader, introduced it during a pep rally before the big game against Texas Christian University Horned Frogs. <laughs> this is the official hand. This is a quote from Harley. Quote, this is the official hand signal of the University of Texas and is to be used anywhere and everywhere Longhorns gather, declared Clark. Well, he had no authorization from the university to make such a proclamation. <laughs> Immediately after the rally, he was approached by administrators who asked if he was aware of what the sign might mean in other, other parts of the world. Quote, just be glad our mascot isn't a unicorn, joked Clark. <laughs> <laughs> that particular part was from bizjournals.com Austin. That's great. Against the wishes of school officials, the Hook'em Horn sign was embraced by the student body. Oh, it took off. Yeah, it really did. Now, in countries such as Italy and Spain, as well as Brazil, Colombia, and some Baltic nations, the sign, known as the corna or cornuto, is an, uh, an offensive gesture uh, indicating to a man that, quote, folks are shacking up with your wife and you have no idea. <laughs> Okay, I've it's, never heard. I've never heard that. Sure, why not? It's called the bullhorn insult, as it came to be known, and it dates back at least twenty five hundred wow. years. <laughs> and it refers to the practice of castrating bulls <laughs> to make them docile. So you can kind oh, of, you great. can put the okay. the implications it's together a... there. <laughs> Some okay. cultures also consider the sign a symbol of devil worship. And this became problematic for President George W. Bush when in 2005 he flashed the Hook'em Horn sign at his second inauguration. Uh, some uh, newspapers in Norway proclaimed that he was hailing Satan. <laughs> oh, I need a cab. Now, <laughs> oh, wait, not that kind not of hailing. Kind of, yeah, not that Sorry. kind of hailing. <laughs> in 1985, use of the gesture also caused five Americans to be arrested in Italy. The group was celebrating a major Longhorn victory by dancing with the devil horns near the Vatican. Whoop. <laughs> oh. So that's the hook 'em horns. Now, how well, about. Well, wait a minute. I just, like, do they not have rock concerts over there? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a huge rock. Yeah. That's straight up. Yes. Yeah. That's straight up. Not, not angled out. So. Well, yeah, I don't know that it makes I any think, sense. Yeah, that's, that's different. Straight up is different from yeah. straight out. Forward, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. No, they don't have rock concerts over there. Now, how about Giga Maggie's? Well, this sign is known in non-Aggie realms as simply a thumbs-up gesture. But according to the Texas A&M website, tamu.edu, the symbol has special meaning for Aggies who will often flash, it, uh, flash the sign and yell, Gig'em! The phrase dates back to 1930. Okay, so the Aggie sign's older a than the longer, longer sign. A little longer, yeah, yeah, yeah. And was popularized by an administrator named P.L. Pinky Downs. And he yelled practice before a game against those same TCU Horn Frogs, who've done a good job of inspiring uh, slogans from other universities. <laughs> and they're kind of ahead of the game on most yeah. of them this Yeah, year. and this year they're the only team that's doing any, any good. Uh, anyway, Down shouted, quote, What are we going to do to those Horn Frogs? Improvising, he borrowed the name of a sharp-pronged frog hunting tool called a gig, and he answering his own question, he shouted, Gig em, Aggies! For emphasis, Downs made a fist with his thumb extended straight up. The website further states that today, the phrase and thumbs-up gesture are a universal sign of approval for Aggies and identify an Aggie or an Aggie fan. Usually done with the right hand, the Giggum sign also showcases the Aggie ring, usually the senior ring. Aggies get a senior ring, which is traditionally worn on the right hand. But even more than that, Giggum signals optimism, determination, loyalty, and the Aggie spirit. That's that's a lot. That's a lot, and a lot for just a gig. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty impressive. Pack a but lot into now one back gesture. to uh, Ms. McManus's article. The thumbs up or gigum symbol that we love in America is not universally revered. In the Middle <laughs> East, for example, it means up your backside, fella. Or worse. <laughs> uh, many, if not most, Latin Americans find it offensive, as do citizens of West Africa, Greece, Russia, Sardinia. The south of, south of Italy, Australia, the Philippines, and many Islamic nations. Yeah, that's a lot of so thumbs up haters, you know. So, so, <laughs> so it's not so universally as loved as uh, the hook'em horns. Okay. <laughs> not quite. <no. laughs> 
The thumbs-up gesture may have been popularized during World War II when American pilots flashed the sign to their ground crews to indicate that they were good to go. The scholars believe it actually originated in ancient Rome when crowds used the thumbs-up sign to mean a gladiator should be speared or killed. <laughs> they are, if they hid their thumbs, that means he should be spared. So you notice that had a negative connotation, the thumbs-up sign. Uh, oh, I thought it was... Uh, okay, so one of my favorite movies is Gladiator. Right. And I thought that was kill them. Yeah, if you put a, yeah, if you down. put the thumbs down, they were gonna go. Yeah, to I think they Hollywood eyes. That, that, that they part. might that have. Hollywood yeah, I mean, yeah. I know you can't would, rely on more, Hollywood. Yeah, it makes more sense to us today that thumbs up would be live, and, and thumbs, thumbs down up. would be right. Uh, you know, kill them. But according to Ms. McManus, the original signs were different. Yeah, hmm. you just don't show it if you want them to survive. However, in parts of Germany and Japan, the symbol simply means the number one. So you can be safe using it there. There you go. We'll do some more hand gestures later in this episode. Well, now there are several in illnesses or conditions of the body that can be at least partially diagnosed by looking at the hand. For example, many different vitamin deficiencies or malnutrition shows as... Lines or ridges in the fingernails. The fingernails can show lots of other things as well. There's the Mises lines, which are white lines or bands that appear on the fingernails or toenails and can be a symptom of arsenic poisoning, <clears throat> thallium, Ooh. as well as thallium poisoning and other heavy metal poisoning. Don't be alarmed, though. Many people have white lines that form across their nails. The main difference is that Mises lines will disappear when you put pressure on them. So the other white lines are usually... Because you hit your nails a lot, yeah, or pounds, they're easily, yeah, yeah they're easily uh, damaged. Yeah, but, carpenter's nails, we call them with those yeah, bruises on yeah. them. <laughs> um, and then thumb. there's, have you ever seen anyone with clubbing of the fingernails? It's where the fingernails kind of seem to wrap around the end of the finger. Like oh. it, they're dished, and like the whole end of the finger is... Becomes part of, the nail covers wow. more than just this. Yes, it, it, it almost like it covers half of the top of the, the oh, wow. fingernail. Good. Anyway, so... This is um, this can show issues with the, the lungs, such as lung cancer, pulmonary really? fibrosis, uh huh, or abscess in the lung. Clubbing can also show heart conditions, such as an inflammation of the inner lining of the heart or swelling and irritation of the thin sac-like tissues surrounding the heart. Wow! I wonder how what the connection is there when you get those issues that makes your nails I know it, so it, different. It is. It's interesting that that <clears throat> it would affect the the fingernails that way. Um, now, people with Down syndrome have unique hands in that there's just one crease going across the palm instead of uh, the two uh, that transverse the, the, from one side to the other. Most people have two, um, but they, they, those two you. lines come together to form just one in people with Down syndrome. And their pinky is often shorter than hmm. usual. I didn't know that. Now, trigger finger. Have you heard of trigger finger? Other than somebody having uh, an itchy, itchy one, trigger, yeah. <laughs> trigger finger. Two first ask questions <laughs> later. You know yeah, you're scratching your finger like at the moment. <laughs> right. Or you're practicing. <laughs> no, listen. Trigger finger is a condition when a tendon or the tunnel it runs through becomes inflamed and makes it hard or impossible for the tendon to move. So people with this condition often have a finger that pops, catches, or gets stuck when you try to bend it or straighten it. Yep. Um, trigger finger or triggering is more common in women than men, which... I found that interesting. Right. Uh, and most often affects the ring finger or thumb. It also occurs most often in people with infl inflammatory forms of arthritis, thyroid disease, and diabetes, but mm. anyone can get it. Um, it can also be due to an injury. So my mm -hmm. youngest kid, my youngest, I'm not my youngest kid, but my youngest son, right. Joe, he was in the nursery at church <laughs> one day when he was three years old. His nickname was Houdini. Because he always was very good at escaping wherever uh -huh. he was in order to play outside. He managed to sneak out of the nursery and make it to the, <clears throat> the glass and metal back door of the church, a heavy door. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. And he couldn't get it quite open. And, in well, he got it open a little bit, and then it shut on his hand. Ouch. Uh, and his screams alerted the nursery that hey, he, he had Houdini absconded, made it out again. right? Uh, he calmed down pretty quickly, though, and it wasn't, you know, there was no blood, there was no swelling, there was no nothing. And um, and he had a really high pain tolerance, too, when he was little. Um, it wasn't until later that day, like, they were playing around, and we went to hand him a popsicle that we noticed that his thumb was bent, and oh. it wouldn't straighten. Oh. He had to have uh, surgery in order to correct it at three years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Wow. This this next condition is where a sudden change in temperature, or according to a website to the website, a sudden change in emotional state. I didn't know that can cause your fingers to blanch and turn white due to a temporary loss of blood flow. This is called right. Raynaud's syndrome and can make your fingers feel numb or even painful. Um, and I have this. Anytime I handle ice or icy water, if I'm not careful, my fingers will turn white. I lose feeling in them. Mm. them. Raynaud's is usually not dangerous, but in some cases can be related to an underlying autoimmune disease like lupus. Really? Mm-hmm. But it's interesting. It says change in temperature or change in emotional state. See, like, I didn't know you, the like emotion. you get frightened or something? Or I didn't like know the emotional state one. Now, when I played outside as a kid in the snow... Uh, my pinky and my ring fingers, like, you know, your hands yeah, get yeah. red, right? Oh, yeah. They're really red. And then my pinkies and ring fingers would just go straight completely white. white. It's time to go in. Wow. It's time to go in. Mm. And here recently, uh, I, I took a picture and I'll put it on Facebook. I uh, I took a picture because I was eating ice out of ice water, right. you know, and I kept dipping it in. And I was reading and I wasn't paying attention and my fingers went numb and I looked and they were <laughs> they were just absolutely white. I do have it. Click. Yep. New fig. New there thing. you go. Right. Sophie. One condition that affects the bones in the hands as well as the bones in the arms is holt Orum syndrome. The most obvious sign of the condition is the fingerization of the thumbs. We'll have a picture of this, too. But The, the fingerization hand, of the thumb. Yes. The hand looks like it has five fingers and no thumb. Oh. The thumb is long and connected to the hand more closely to where the fingers are connected than the regular thumb. About hmm. 75% of people with uh, holt Orum syndrome also suffer from cardiac problems. Oh, well, that's weird. I wonder how it would affect your ability to hold on to things. Or grab them and pick them up. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I mean, yeah. as long as it's opposable, turn. it's, you yeah, know. As long as it can turn the sideways. It just looks so bizarre. Yeah. Now, take a look at y'all's fingers. Okay, specifically your pointer finger or index finger and yeah. your ring finger. Are they the same length or is your ring finger longer than your uh, index finger? Mine are about the same. My index finger is about an eighth, a quarter, maybe an eighth longer. Oh, really? Oh, there you go. See, okay, so here's the thing. This may be an indication, if you were a male, that you may be prone to aggression. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or, I'm aggressive. <laughs> so or, aggressive. tell us something we didn't know. <laughs> or, or if, <laughs> or if you're a female and and your ring finger is longer, it could mean that you have a knack for spatial uh, acuity. tasks. Yeah, acuity. Mm. So here, okay, quick digression into sex education, and we'll keep it PG. All right. From our days in biology class, we know that when you have an X chromosome and another X chromosome, then you will have a female baby. Right. And when there's an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, the baby will be male. Did you know that Y chromosome was a mutant? So all males are mutants. <laughs> anyway. I totally that, resemble I, this. I, I, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> but those chromosomes trigger at a very specific uh, time in the development of a fetus a wash of hormones that causes the sexual organs to develop into as either male or female, right? Right. right. It also affects what scientists call the finger length ratio, which is a com comparison in length of the index finger and ring finger. Right. So these two fingers tend to be about the same length in women, but men's ring fingers tend to be a bit longer than their index fingers. And scientists consider this to be a marker of testosterone exposure in the womb. So the longer the ring finger in comparison to the index finger, the more testosterone scientists consider a male to have been exposed <laughs> to in the way. Right about the same. I didn't get, no, I, I mean, this is a scientific study. This isn't like on some yeah. kind of funky website. Yeah. I got this from a medical journal. Um, <laughs> yeah. So and, and so they consider that like they've done right. all of these tests and those men tend to be uh, do better in sports, have more of an well, athletic acuity. Because my coach said <laughs> he's not very tall, but he sure is slow. So, you know, that's a. Uh, Who said that? My coach. So, yeah. Oh. <laughs> explain why I didn't do it. It's all I had to do with my fingers. I, I was shorted on some testosterone back in the day. And when it comes to women, a, Nor a Norwegian study found women with higher levels of prenatal testosterone exposure, as measured by digit ratio, did better on spatial tasks than women with low levels. And so I looked at mine. I, I asked my aunt and I asked my sister because we're all draftsmen. Right. They all have, or I have been in the past a draftsman. Right. And they're draftsmen. And so we, we do have that spatial thing going. 
nope, all of us have the same length Listen. fingers. Uh -huh. <laughs> I got my information from stanfordmedicine25.stanford.edu, health.com, and medlineplus.gov. I want to go look at Michael Jordan's fingers, see if he's got the long <laughs> I was just going to say. Maybe he's got long fingers. I, I would say it's hair on the body, and y'all are just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for something, you know, a little bit less serious. Oh, that was serious? <laughs> well, several years ago, a movie came out called uh, The House with a Clock in Its Walls. Did Did you see it? Did you went, a no, House with a Clock in Its Walls. Yeah, it was okay. It's got Jack Black in so it. Okay. It is really cool. I was going to say, what, did it come yeah. out like an it's international a, film festival? Or? No, it's a kid's movie. Oh. It's a, well, and I say okay. it's a kid's movie. It's like a preteen. Okay. Anyway, it looked really good to me. And I knew that I wanted to take my daughter, who's in junior high at the time, to see it. But if a movie's based on a book, and this one was, then I always tried to read the book first. And right. as luck would have it, we had a road trip in our future. We were, we had a family vacation where it just so happened that just me and Tori would be in a car together for three hours there and three hours back. And so I downloaded the audio book. Mm -hmm. And uh, we loved it. I didn't know how well it would go because it was written in 1973. Right. Um, but we loved it. And it was the first of 12 books that he had written. And so John Belair's, I believe. Yeah. Okay. John Belair's. And so we, we even listened to a couple other books. And we saw the movie. We loved it. Anyway, the whole reason I'm bringing this up is because there was something in the book that absolutely just took me by surprise. I'd never heard of it before. And it was the use of a relic called the Hand of Glory. Hand of Glory. Have either one of you heard of that? Seems like I have, but I couldn't tell you what it is. Okay. But... It was used in a context to imply that it had meaning outside the story, and it was something I'd never heard of. So not I went that, to not, not the Hand Google. of Midas. But right. No, the Hand of Glory. Hand of glory. Okay. So I went to Google and went down the rabbit hole. And this is weird mm -hmm. and interesting. All right. Tell us about the Hand mm -hmm. of Glory. The Hand of yeah. Glory is a magical object made from... The pickled or dried hand of a felon. Of a felon. Of a felon yeah. who either had his hand cut off for an, a crime or was executed by hanging, and then the hand would be removed while the man was still suspended from the noose. Ooh. Several okay. Several old European manuscripts describe the different ways to make a hand of glory, such as using it uh, in a clenched fashion, you know, so the hand would be clenched. So that it would, it could hold a candle. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Yikes. Or with a candle wedged between two of the fingers, or even with the the hands splayed open and the fingers themselves being lit as though they were candles. Well, they were short of candle holders back in the old days. <laughs> well, no, here's they just the deal. It some had interesting ones. I mean... It had magical properties. Though. Oh, of course, of course it did. <laughs> Illuminate us. <laughs> the relic was then used in a variety of magical ways, usually by burglars. It was said to have the power to unlock doors, provide light only to the one holding it, no. and to send the sleeping victims in a house into a coma from which they were unable to wake while they were being burglarized. Oh, the that's Whit some special hands. It, okay, the Whitley, not Whitley, sorry, Whitby Museum in Whitby, England, mm -hmm. has the only known surviving hand of glory. Oh, Whitby, I've been there. That's and, place. Yeah, so you could have seen the hand of glory. I, I missed it. I have to go back. And I've got my information from Atlas Obscura, Wikipedia, and then I came across this amazing collection of folklore curated and or translated by uh, D.L. Ashleman, now retired professor of German from University of Pittsburgh. And I stumbled across all of his papers and writings online and now have to find the time to read it all. <laughs> uh, he's a prolific no, folklorist thing. and has a couple books on Amazon. So he had... Um, a couple other notes in there related to thieves' thumbs, which kind of is in the same vein of Hands of Glory. Right. This German myth was collected by Jacob Grimm, okay? Uh, hey, so one of the Grimm brothers, brothers right? Yeah. And says that thieves would cut off, uh, this is so gross and so horrible, they would cut off the thumb of an unborn child oh. and light it as a candle. Mm. As long as it's burning, everyone in the house will remain asleep. Yeah, that and how in, works. And how, how they... in the world do you obtain the fingers of an yeah. unborn child? When a female thief or murderer is executed while she's pregnant, then you're to, quote, okay, go forth at midnight on the devil's roads, not the God's roads, which, I mean, how do you know the difference? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm thinking our, well our freeway is <laughs> not, it's road. of the devil. Right. Um, you're, you're to go forth 
at midnight on the devil's roads, not the God's roads, with incantations of magic, not with prayer and blessings, which mm. I'm thinking if you're on this yeah. thing, you're not yeah. going to be yeah. praying it's, about it. It's not going good. Um, and you must take an axe or a knife that has been used by an executioner. <laughs> and with it, you must open up the poor sinner's belly, take out the child, cut off the fingers and take them with you. Ooh. I know, right? Grizzly practice. <laughs> Leave the rest behind. So this was in Grimm's. Yeah. 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 Stuff. Okay. I don't There's... know if it was in Grimm's fairy tales, but yeah. it was, it was, it was it folklore. documented pa- party, by yeah. party in his notes or something. I'm thinking Grimm had some this. issues. We might need to do a whole, <laughs> right? uh, whole episode on Grimm. <laughs> Grimm. On the Grimm. The yeah. Grimm the Grimm brothers. I mean, really. <laughs> and now for something completely off topic and off kilter. Brace yourself for the oddity du jour. Well, speaking of people going down the road, the wrong road, you know, the sports and entertainment world has been rocked by recent scandals. Well, you say that, you know. No, I don't know. Like, because I don't. <laughs> well, surely you've heard of, uh, <laughs> even here locally, uh, the trash can uh, sign stealing. Oh, with our, yes. With our no, Houston was that Astros. with... Oh, okay. Yeah, it's been a few I, years, I have yes. heard. I have heard yeah. a little bit about it. And okay. then a few years ago, there was Deflate Gate. The, yes, uh, the football. Fa- yeah, football. The, the one of the okay uh, famous quarterbacks. Uh, their football was supposed to be inflated to a certain pressure, but it seems like he wanted to deflate it a little bit so he could grip them better. Uh. Well, for our oddity du jour today. Uh, as much as we hate to report on these kinds of human shortcomings, we have <laughs> uncovered some more. Cheating scandals. Ooh. Yeah. From an Irish publication called The Independent comes word of a major scandal in the world of competitive Irish dancing. Oh. Yeah. This The article is titled Exclusive Irish Dancing Rocked by Major Allegations of com- Competition Fixing Involving Dance Teachers and Judges. No. Yeah. You really hate to hear about so. this kind of sordid goings <laughs> on. The prestigious global body that governs Irish dancing, and I'm just going to use the initials C-L-R-G because I couldn't pronounce the actual name. <laughs> they're Gaelic. We're, not, they're gonna actually, Irish, we're I mean. not actually going to butcher them? Is, you guys is, are so lucky. Anyway, the C-L-R-G is dealing with its largest ever alleged cheating scandal, which has seen some of the most successful and well-regarded Irish dance teachers in schools accused of fixing competitions for their own students. No. Evidently, screenshots of text conversations showing 12 Irish dance teachers either asking for or offering to fix competitions were handed over to the CLRG in July of 2022. In one case, a dance teacher and a a competition judge appeared to be exchanging um, favors (laughs) for higher scores. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. (laughs) Oh, wow. The CLRG said that its ethics committee had, quote, received allegations with supporting documentation of several grievous breaches of our code of conduct. Quote, such unethical behavior cannot and will not be tolerated by this organization, it said. (laughs) So what could be motivating such outrageous behavior? Well, current and former Irish dancing teachers and and competitors who spoke to the Irish Independent on the condition of anonymity, they don't want this coming back on them, they said that a school with reputation for success can generate more in fees. So there you have it. Greed raises its ugly head to besmirch the pure reputation of Irish dancing. Oh, I love Greed. Irish dancing. I know, it's <laughs> it's hard, really cool. Hard to believe people are cheating at it. Yeah. But unfortunately, that's not the only cheating scandal that we found. No. no. Say it. Yes. So there's more? There's more. According to, this is what you call witty repartee right here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how witty we High are spirited today. Witty very repartee. sarcastic today. <laughs> yeah. According to the Wall Street Journal, professional cornhole was also, oh has a cheating scandal. Was there not enough corn in the bags? That's, uh, that's what oh. they're saying. It's called bag gate. <laughs> So oh, you got to explain what cornhole is. Well, in case That's you don't know, cornhole so is a game which players attempt to toss a beanbag through a hole in a slanted board that's 27 feet away, or roughly 9 meters for you in the metric system world. Uh, it has emerged from a backyard pastime into serious competition. Oh, it's serious. Perhaps the greatest controversy in the history of the sport of cornhole unfolded in August of 2022 
at the American Cornhole Leagues. That's the ACLU World. I'm sorry, the ACL. <laughs> the ACLU. The ACL. The ACL World Championship in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Was the number one ranked double team using illegal bean bags? Oh, Did you even no. know that doubles cornhole was a thing? Well, evidently <laughs> <Nope>. it is. <laughs> Quote. I thought the bags were a little too thin, oh. recalls Devin Har Harbaugh, <laughs> who lodged a complaint against the <laughs> rivals Mark Richards and Philip Lopes. Or was it Lopez? I'm sorry, oh, Lopez. Uh, Mark Richards and Philip Lopez at stake was a $15,000 prize. Okay, now we're talking. Uh, with the Cornhole World watching live on ESPN. Really? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. A really slow <laughs> sports oh, my day. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, Officials inspected time. the bags with the solemnity required for such a grave complaint. Then they huddled near sponsored banners for Johnsonville sausage <laughs> product, uh, and uh, bush baked beans. It was true. The bags weren't regulation size. Quote, they're too small, color commentator <laughs> Mark Pr uh, Pryor explained to the viewers. That's going to create some drama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you yell it out there like that. Oh, sure. my goodness. <sighs> So then, Richards and Lopez ask officials to check Harbaugh's team's bags. Turns out, they were too small, too. These people are playing with bags that are too small. <laughs> the Wall Street Journal article further states that cornhole is, is growing quickly with big-name sponsors and serious athletes. Really, athletes? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't know how, how athletic do you have to be, but at least competitors. The ACL uh, boasts about 155,000 members, and that's up from 125,000 in, uh, in just uh, 2021. The total number of events tops 22,000 events, up from about 14,000 last year. So there's a lot of cornhole going around. You know, I didn't, wasn't aware <laughs> I mean, there's a whole lot of drinking. And yeah, I was like, they, they sell a lot of beer. Right. <laughs> yeah. Top ACL players can make up to $250,000 a year from winnings, endorsements, oh and sponsorship deals. Yeah. This has us wondering, what kind of sponsorship deals? <laughs> Maybe we need to start the Remnant Stew Cornhole Team. You I'm know? Sure. We could sponsor somebody, get us some publicity. Hey, um, Sam, what are you doing? Well, anyway, <laughs> since a lighter, thinner bag could provide an advantage, some players are boiling bags or washing them with vinegar to try to make them more pliable and slick. Okay. Others are bringing out sandpaper, hammers, and rubber mallets. Quote, you have the average players that try everything to make the bag do different things, says <laughs> Nate Voyer, a cornhole professional who prefers to wash his bag with a little fabric softener and let it air dry. Cornhole bags, according to ACL regulations, must be 6 by 6 inches when laid flat and weigh 16 ounces with slight specified variations tolerated. Uh, after a one-hour delay, officials at the World Championship decided that no intentional violations had taken place and opted to continue the contest. With the same bags? With the same bags. Was there cheating? It's possible. But I'm pretty confident that it wasn't intentional, says ACL spokesman Trey Ryder. Uh, new regulations are brewing, and there's talk of a crackdown to root out iffy bags. <laughs> the evolving sport is proving it's never just fun and games when money is tossed into the mix. So, I yeah, have, think. hate to hear these I sort of no goings idea. on in the Irish dancing and cornhole, cornhole. world. Cornhole. Now, I think we could combine those two events. <laughs> <laughs> While you're dancing the jig, you have See to throw a bag throw, through a hole. Okay. 27 feet. Competitive Irish dancing cornhole. Several years ago, somebody gave me, um, and I had a little kids, you know, gave me a cornhole set, set as mm. a gift. And... And I had no idea what cornhole was. Yeah. I'm just like, this is a kids' carnival game. <laughs> like, what? This is, you know, right. I had it's big no time now. clue oh, that yeah. it was as big as it was. And and I mean, so ESPN it, shows up to film. Right. Like we're going to the Olympics next. Yeah, yeah pretty much. You get, the, you get the Johnsonville sausage and the Bush's baked beans to sponsorships sponsor. right there. Oh my gosh, Ooh, that is so yeah. funny. <laughs> You guys know that I love symbols, and so I couldn't let this opportunity go by without looking into a symbol you've probably seen. It's in the shape of a hand, usually with an eye in the center of the palm. A palm reader, right? No, no. Oh, no. that's what I thought uh -uh. that was. I've seen it many places, and 
And I just had the the general idea that it was a religious symbol. Oh, okay. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But I, I had no idea what it really was or uh, what religion it belonged to. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to educate myself. Oh, we do that here all the time. That's right. This symbol is called the Hamza. That's H-A-M-S-A. And I was surprised to learn that it's very old, like pre-Christianity old. Uh-huh. Um, as in 8th century BCE, oh, wow. Israelite back, tomb was found to contain a Hamza-like hand inscription. But according to Wikipedia, the Hamza is used primarily as an amulet or decoration and is popular in West Africa and the Middle East, with nearly every home having a Hamza for protection and every woman of the region having at least one piece of Hamza jewelry. Many different faiths have used the symbol, but specifically Judaism, Islam, and even Christianity. Right. It's speculated that Sephardic Jews were among the first. Sephardic Jews were uh, are also known as Hispanic Jews who live in the Iberian Peninsula region of southwestern Europe. Yeah, Spain and Portugal. Others speculate that the Sephardic Jews adopted the symbol from Islamic communities nearby so that right. perhaps it was some over, uh, like, over carryover. bleeding yeah. over yeah. in the cultures there. So some people say it, it originated with the Hispanic Jews and some say they it originated with the Islamic communities. So what does the hand and eye symbolism of the Hamza stand for? In general, it's a symbol of good luck, prosperity, and a symbol to ward off evil. The Hamza doesn't always include the eye, but according to my research, the hand is typically the palm side of the right hand. Most of the symbols I see are created to be symmetrical, meaning the pinky finger looks like the mirror image of a thumb. The open right hand is religiously significant and can be found in the images of several faiths. So, I mean, like, think of Jesus... You know, and, and the Pope and, and all that. Um, and it's and used in religious ceremonies to denote blessings. It's seen as a sign of protection and also represents power and strength. The okay. way the hand is depicted can mean many different things. For instance, when the fingers are spread apart, it's to ward off evil. If they're closed, then it's to bring prosperity and luck. And also if the Hamza is displayed with the fingers pointing up, it's to ward off bad luck, and if the fingers are pointing down, then it's to bestow blessings. And that makes me think of those statues of Buddha where he's got both right. hands um, in blessing and, and, I guess, warding off evil. If there's an eye in the middle of the hand, then the Hamza is being used to ward off the evil eye or bad luck in oh, general. I see. Yeah. I got my information from Wikipedia. <laughs> Get this, evil-i.shop, <laughs> where you could purchase these, and uh, myjewishlearning.com. How much does one of those go for, I wonder? Well, I mean, I guess it depends. I mean, you How can big get, do you want one? Yeah, you we get should have put it on our holiday and... buying list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about we get back to some hand gestures now? And oh, we've all done this even as little kids. Crossed fingers. When you want to wish someone good luck, you'll often tell them, quote, Cross I'll fingers. keep my fingers crossed. Or get... when you want to tell a lie. Like you're yeah. promising oh, something. Oh, you yeah. get your... <laughs> that cancels out. Yeah. Your right. fingers I, behind I remember your back. that, too. Uh, anyway, you're hoping that they'll get the promotion or maybe get pregnant or win the lottery. The gesture is made by crossing your middle finger over your pointer. If you really, really want to wish someone good luck, you might tell them, quote, I'll cross all my fingers and my toes, too. That is if you live in the United States, Canada, the UK, or Australia. But if you happen to be a resident of Vietnam, you'll view cross fingers as a vulgar symbol. Uh, even worse, if another person crosses his finger at you, then it's an especially shocking and hard offense. Cross fingers are an ancient European superstition. Originally, the person locked fingers with another to form a cross, like an X, like the Scottish cross of St. Andrews. And the wish good luck uh, is kind of a good luck symbol, too. Later, the custom devolved into just one person crossing his or her fingers. And now, most of the time, we say, We'll cross our fingers for you, but we don't really even do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep my fingers crossed, but no, we don't really do that. All right, now, back in the 90s, you might have heard this expression, talk to the hand, because the face ain't listening. Oh, I hated it. <laughs> I hated that. Popular uh, American phrase began in the 1990s uh, on a television show hosted by comedian Martin Lawrence, and it was account- accompanied by a gesture of thrusting out your hand towards someone else with your fingers spread and the palm out. While only mildly rude in the United States, the gesture is very nasty and even confrontational in other lands. 
It's most popularly associated uh, with Greece, where it's called the Mutza. Those who give the Mutza, that's a M-O-U-T-Z-A, often accompany the gesture by saying, nah, which means, here you go. Okay, so that doesn't make a lot of sense until you hear the rest of it, though. Supposedly, the gesture has its roots in ancient Byzantium, where people shamed criminals by scooping up ashes and cinders and other things. Those were called the mutzas in their hands, and then they rubbed them on the offenders' faces as they were being marched to the streets. So that's the, here you go. Oh, uh, okay. All right. In addition to Greece, the gesture is unwelcome in parts of Africa and Pakistan. While the Japanese don't employ the mutza, they have a very similar gesture with the thumb uh, tucked in. Incidentally, the mutza's basic meaning is, ag- is an aggressive, to heck with you, buddy, or something even stronger. Right. Mm. Oh. Now... When you think of it, the going back to our first one, we talked that finger in the United States, uh, using the finger to deeply degrade someone was kind of a small, meek hand gesture, considering the hefty insult that it's supposed to convey. Well, the European forearm jerk, in contrast, is a much meatier gesture. Uh, first, you take your right hand and you make a tight fist. Then you jerk your right hand up as as you slap your bicep with your left hand. (laughs) Southern European males, uh, again, in Italy, I've seen this, uh, using those, uh, including those in France uh, who call it the bras d'honneur, use the forearm jerk as a crude, phallic way to flip someone the bird. It can also indicate sentiments such as, I'm better than you are. Get lost, loser. Or up yours, buddy. (laughs) In Brazil, the gesture is known as the banana, although its meaning is the same. Men in, Brazil, in Britain and uh, Germany sometimes make the forearm jerk as a way of indicating that they're longing for a particular woman, although they wouldn't make that gesture in the woman's presence. It's just to each other. Shower, locker nice. room kind of gesture. That's very, thing. very classic. Yeah. Yeah. Now, finally, this one I've never heard of before. It's called the cutis, C-U-T-I-S. Primarily, it's used in India and Pakistan. The hand sign is made by putting the tip of your thumb in your mouth with the rest of your fingers standing straight up. Some people do this with their fingers kind of curled in. Once you make this gesture, you then flick your thumb out of your mouth while crying out, Kuda, which is the Hindu and Urdu version of flipping the bird, (laughs) verbally. Okay, Uh, This gesture is not only an insult to you, but to your entire family, too. Sort of like saying you and your whole family are abominable. Hence its severity. Dishonor on you, dishonor Dishonor on your your cow. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) One of the more notable uses of the kudus was by Pakistan's Shoaib Akhtar, considered the fastest bowler in cricket history. Bowler for Americans uh, would be a pitcher. Akhtar gave the kudus in Melbourne, Australia, during a rain delay in the 2004 Test Series against Australia. The meaning was lost on the Australian host, but became a sensation back in Pakistan when the incident was shown on television. After retiring, Akhtar became a color commentator during cricket matches. Just last year, his fiery temperament caused him to sign out and shout the word kudus toward his uh, uh, his broadcast booth partner and then storm out of the broadcast booth. So you know, right in the oh, middle of a, a wow. cricket match. That's drama for you. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so, you know, I think we did pretty well in keeping our... Um, uh, ourselves uh, with maybe not a G, but at least a PG rating. Yeah, I think today. we did good. We <laughs> yeah. did good. So once again, we wish to thank Melanie McManus and HowStuffWorks.com for allowing us to quote from their fine article. Thank you. Well, I've saved this particular topic involving the hands for last. It's the controversial topic of stigmata. Uh-oh. According to Burkana, uh, sorry, Burkanita. <laughs> Those people, they're at it again. According to Britannica.com, stigmata is defined as Christian mysticism involving bodily marks, scars, or pains corresponding to those of the crucified Jesus Christ oh, right. yeah. appearing on the hands and feet of a person. The marks can also extend to the forehead from the crown of thorns and the back from Christ's scourging, his whipping. Right, yeah. The presence of stigmata is seen by the Roman Catholic Church as a sign of mystical union with the suffering Christ, and a genuine stigmatic must have lived a life of heroic virtue. Right. The first instance of stigmata occurred, and I I didn't know this, in St. Francis of Assisi, 
Oh, wow. So when you see those statues in the garden, because he right. was uh, an animal lover, um, he was the first to have stigmata. At, he Apparently, he had been visited by an angel in the year 1224, and afterwards is when the stigmata I appeared. See. Pope Alexander IV and others attested that they had seen these marks both before and after Francis' death. So so while he yeah. was alive, but and then after he died, so in some of these cases, you know, a lot of the people, well, and, and I'm going to go on to, to state that it, a lot of these cases turn out to be hoaxes, oh, yeah, that they're right. doing it to themselves, but I think it was there their indication. seems to be genuine. Yeah. yeah. Well, after that, after uh, Francis of Assisi, more than 300 people from the 14th century to the 20th century have come forward to show that they, too, bear the marks of Christ's physical suffering. Nearly all have been members of the Roman Catholic Church, and a great majority of them, I think like maybe 86 percent, have been women. Right. The stigmatic wounds still sometimes or will sometimes produce a few drops of blood, and some will bleed profusely. Mm. Mm. While various stigmatics have been investigated by the Catholic Church and deemed to be truly miraculous, with 60 of them being canonized as saints, many others have been shown to be fraudulent. Mm. Magdalena de la Cruz, a Franciscan nun who for many years was honored as a living saint for her stigmata, confessed before she died that her stigmata was a deliberate deception. Oh, no. An article in TheGuardian.com takes a skeptical view on stigmata, saying that, quote, the personality profile of the typical stigmatic is not a happy one. Many contemporary subjects have been victims of abuse and suffer low self-esteem. Most stigmata are deliberately self-inflicted or follow more complex patterns of self-harm like those of Manchowson syndrome. Mm. So if you... If you're aware, I think most people have heard of Munchausen's by Munchausen proxy, yeah, yeah. where a caretaker, typically a woman, will keep their child sick or whatever. Right, yeah. um, but Munchausen's is is where you do it to yourself. You, right. you remain sick or yeah. stay sick for that Yeah, attention. the other one's Munchausen by proxy. Right, yeah. right. The article goes on to say that one common criticism of stigmata sufferers is that their wounds appear in locations on their hands and feet that reflect religious art. More than what we know that more than what we now know the genuine Roman crucifixion techniques to be. Right. In other words, Christ was probably not pierced through the palms of his hands in the center of his feet like many Renaissance paintings show, but rather through the more sturdier of places like the wrist, wrist. bones and the heel bones. Yeah. Right. Uh, the Guardian.com article notes that this is so <laughs> Cynical. New Age stigmatics have adapted to this new historical understanding. <laughs> so cynical. Uh-huh. Whatever you believe, when it comes to stigmata, be it miracle or hoax, you have to admit it's absolutely fascinating stuff. It is. I, I, what I've read is that, you know, particularly if there's a crucifix in a church that this person has visited their whole life, their marks will show up at the same place as the marks. Right. That and that it's a lot of the times it's. Um, it's a psychological thing. Yeah. Yes. You know, whether whether it's it's a true miracle or a hoax, it is still a, a psychological thing because it's a connection that they have, a spiritual connection that they have with Christ. Um, I got my information from Britannica.com, TheGuardian.com, and Wikipedia. And now it's time, boys and girls, for the trivia challenge. <laughs> Well, this has been a great episode about all things hands and handy. Um, now for our trivia challenge, you know how this works. Like and follow our Facebook page at Remnant Stew Podcast. Like and share this episode post. Put your answer to the trivia challenge question in the comments of that post. The first person to do all of that will be the winner and will be mentioned in an upcoming episode of Remnant Stew. We're also opening our trivia challenge up to school kids. So pay Woo-hoo. attention back there. If your classroom listens to Remnant Stew and they want to answer the trivia question, then send us an email with the answer to staycurious at remnantstew.com. If your class wins, we'll send a cool little care package to the class. So what's our question today, Leah? This comes from Harbin. Yeah, um, Harbin. And the question is this notoriously horrible movie. I've never seen this movie, by the way. Uh, this I had no idea it even existed. This notoriously horrible movie featured a storyline that revolved around the main character's enormous thumbs. Name that movie. I'm being wow. quiet now. <clears throat> okay. Hey, thanks for spending some time with us. 
Check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Remnant Stew Podcast. You can also send us an email to say hi or suggest a topic for a future episode at staycurious at remnantstew.com. We'd love to hear from you. Remnant Stew is a part of Rook and Raven Ventures and is created by me, Leah Lamb. Dr. Stephen Meeker and I research, write, and host each episode along with commentary by our audio producer, Philip Sinkville. Theme music is by Kevin McLeod with voiceover by Morgan Hughes. Special thanks goes out to Judy Meeker and Harbin Gold. Well, now, before you go, hit the follow button so you won't miss an episode. Head on over to Apple Music and leave us a review. We love reading those reviews. Share Remnant Stew with your friend, your family, old Mr. Hands. You remember him from back on those Mr. Bill cartoons back on SNL? In the I days? remember Mr. Bill, but I don't remember Mr. <laughs> oh, Mr. Hands. Mr. Hands was the one who made him. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, our, uh, I remember from Johnny Carson's show, there was a guy that came on who was a manualist. He would play songs with his hands. So if you run into that guy, too, tell him to tune in to Remnant Stew. And until <laughs> next time, remember, choose to be kind and, and always stay curious. curious.